it's actually the nurse who's most often the person who first identifies sepsis in patients. So I think it's really important to trust your clinical judgment. When you look at a patient, it's really easy to tell when something is wrong, when they're starting to breathe too heavy or they're a little bit off and they're starting to get some altered mental status or suddenly their heart rate is elevated for no reason, even though they're just lying in bed. So nurses are really positioned and are most often the ones who first pick up on these subtle signs. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. Today, we're talking with ONS member, Laura Zatella, about febrile neutropenia and sepsis in patients with cancer. This episode is part of a series about oncologic emergencies. The previous episodes are linked in the episode notes. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining us today, Laura. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here with you, Stephanie. So as we have talked about onc emergencies in past episodes, you know, this is one that I would suspect that almost all of the nurses working in oncology are going to experience at some point in taking care of oncology patients. It's definitely something that folks who may be working in the transplant area or with patients who have hemalignancies, but definitely for our listeners who are new nurses, new to oncology, this is going to be one that is going to be extremely helpful for them in their practice. So to start us off, can you define both febrile neutropenia and sepsis for us? Absolutely. So first of all, I completely agree with you. Every oncology nurse needs to know how to manage febrile neutropenia, infection, and sepsis. And actually, what we're going to talk about today, there's new guidelines that came out in 2021 regarding sepsis. So I think there's updated information for both new and experienced nurses at this time. So to start off with the definition of febrile neutropenia and sepsis, febrile neutropenia is technically defined as a absolute neutrophil count less than 500 or less than 1,000 with an expected decline to less than 500 over the next 48 hours because we know that the patient is going into their nadir from their treatment. And that's in combination with a fever. It could be a single oral temperature of 101, or it could be a sustained temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit for more than an hour. We know that fever and neutropenia in combination needs to be treated immediately. This is a high-risk oncologic emergency. Our patients who have febrile neutropenia are very high risk of having a serious infection or sepsis. Now, sepsis is very different. Sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Not every patient who has an infection or febrile neutropenia will develop sepsis. So what really distinguishes sepsis is the presence of a dysregulated immune response and life-threatening organ dysfunction. Thank you for explaining those. As we've said, all nurses are probably going to see this. So it's really good to understand what the difference in those two are. So can you talk about how these definitions have evolved over time? You mentioned updates and guidelines. Is there something that has changed with these definitions? Yeah, there's a lot that's changed. I would say through the entire 1990s and up until 2016, 
the definitions of sepsis included categories for sepsis, severe sepsis, and sepsis shock. And one of the most common screening tools for sepsis was called the SIRS criteria, the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, SIRS criteria. And that's the one you and I are most familiar with, what we've used for our entire nursing careers. And it basically is a temperature greater than 38 or less than 36. So fever or hypothermia, a heart rate greater than 90, respirations greater than 20, and a white blood cell count that's elevated above 12 or low, below four. And so if you had these inflammatory criteria in the setting of known or suspected infection, this was called sepsis and sepsis protocols should be initiated. And then severe sepsis was having sepsis and organ dysfunction and septic shock was having sepsis and hypotension that did respond to fluid resuscitation. Well, all of that changed in 2016, where the criteria for severe sepsis was eliminated. Now we have sepsis and we have septic shock. And there was some concern that the SIRS criteria were not the best screening tool because, for example, every single patient with febrile neutropenia would be fall into the sepsis category because they all have a low white blood cell count and they all have fevers. And not every patient with febrile neutropenia had sepsis. So we were really over-treating a lot of patients and they wanted to come up with something that was a little more sensitive. So they came up with the SOFA criteria, which is the sequential or the sepsis organ function assessment. And then they had something called QSOFA, the quick SOFA. The quick SOFA assessment was three criteria. One was alteration in mental status, blood pressure less than 100, and respirations greater than 22. So it was quick and easy. And so those were the kind of new criteria. Well, that's all changed again in 2021, because after reviewing all of the data, it turns out that QSOFA is not as sensitive. And so it is no longer recommended as a screening tool. And instead, it's recommended that we go back to SIRS or NEWS or MUSE, which are national early warning signs and modified early warning signs, which are a couple of other screening tools that are used in some hospitals. So things have changed quite a bit. We still have the two criteria of sepsis and sepsis shock. And sepsis, of course, is life-threatening or organ dysfunction because of a dysregulated host response to infection. And septic shock is a subset of sepsis that doesn't respond to our initial interventions of fluid resuscitation and requires vasopressors. Well, thank you. If this isn't confusing enough, and then having all of those different guidelines to look at how you can classify a patient. Right. Well, thank you for those explanations. I think we'll get into more of that a little later on as we discuss this further. But I want to ask you now, can you talk about why patients with cancer are at increased risk for infection? Patients with cancer are at increased risk of infection because of the inherent immunosuppression of the cancer itself and also the treatment. Some examples of immunosuppression include obviously neutropenia, which we talked about, which could be due to the cancer itself or treatments like dose-dense chemotherapy regimens. There's other risk factors such as any like organ dysfunction or poor performance status, poor nutritional status. Any breaks in the mucosa could be an entry point for infection. So I am particularly vigilant about patients who have poor dentition or patients who develop mucositis because those are known factors that increase the risk of infection. Having venous access devices can increase the risk of infection or patients with indwelling urinary catheters, patients who have radiation, dermatitis, where there's a break in the skin are at increased risk, patients with graft versus host disease. So there's a lot of different reasons why patients who have cancer and are undergoing cancer treatment are at high risk for infection. That's a great explanation, especially for our listeners, just to understand what kind of puts a patient in that risk category. So you talked about some of that and you talked about some of the pre-existing factors that patients might have. 
that would put them at risk for an infection. But are there certain patient groups in our oncology patient population that puts them at a higher risk? Absolutely. I think it's probably easiest to tell you who's at the lowest risk. So the lowest risk patients would be patients who have solid tumors, who are being treated with therapy that doesn't cause prolonged neutropenia. So either doesn't cause neutropenia at all, or they're neutropenic for less than a week. Patients who are at highest risk are patients who are profoundly neutropenic, an ANC less than 100 for more than 7 to 10 days. And maybe in addition to that, also have some B-cell deficits or T-cell deficits, like our patients with lymphoma undergoing chemotherapy and immunotherapy, or patients who have acute myeloid leukemia, or patients who are undergoing a bone marrow transplant, or cellular therapy, because we have a lot of cellular therapies now, like CAR T cell therapy, which causes a very prolonged, prolonged cytopenias, but also prolonged deficits in T cells as well. Okay, Laura. So now we're going to talk about the nurses that are taking care of these patients who are at higher risk and they have listened to us. They know what patient populations they need to think about. What are some preventative measures that, you know, the nurses can take or that they can teach their patients and their caregivers to help decrease that risk for infection? There are some very, very basic things that patients can do. The most important is good hand washing. I explained to patients that your skin is the best barrier against getting an infection. There's no break in the skin, then infection cannot get in. So if your hands get contaminated and you wash them before you touch your eyes or your mouth or your nose, then that is a good way to prevent infection. You're not going to have microorganisms enter your body. So it seems very simple and basic, but I do spend a lot of time talking about it to really emphasize the importance and illustrate to them how effective it is as a preventive measure. And then I do talk about food safety. I talk about guidelines to make sure that food is cooked to the appropriate temperature, that they're washing fresh fruits and vegetables well. I don't restrict fresh fruits and vegetables because there is no data to support that that decreases the risk of infection. And nutrition is very important for our patients. So I do encourage them to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but to wash it carefully. And then chilling food properly and, you know, eating leftovers within a day or two. So just really appropriate food safety guidelines. Avoiding people who are sick is very important. And in the era of COVID, it's been extraordinarily hard to offer patients advice because truly they're at risk of getting COVID by leaving the house. So I spend a lot of time talking to them, encouraging them to determine risk benefit. What's really important for them to take the risk that they could possibly get COVID? I make sure they understand the symptoms of COVID and tell them to let us know if it happens, because we can prescribe right now, we're using an antiviral Paxlovid, but there are things that we can do if they do get COVID to decrease the chance that they have a serious infection. And then of course, many of my patients have gotten Evusel because they either can't get vaccinated or had no response to the vaccine. And all of my patients, I recommend them get vaccinated if they can. So those are the major preventive measures. However, even if a patient does everything perfect. Most of the time when you're neutropenic, the infections that develop come from endogenous organisms. So our body is colonized with probably 10 times as many microbes as human cells. And when the immune system is suppressed, it allows these organisms that we're already colonized with sometimes to cause infection. And so it's very important for them to know that if they have signs of infection, that they should let us know so that we can start immediate treatment to treat the infection. Excellent. Thank you. So now that we've talked a little bit about what kind of things to look for, the patients that are at risk, can you talk about what are the signs of infection in this population of cancer patients? Yeah, I think everyone's familiar with signs of infection, you know, fevers, chills, nausea, 
vomiting, redness or swelling at the site of a line or really anywhere, diarrhea. But in our patients, the presentation can be a little bit more subtle because if you don't have a lot of white cells, sometimes you don't have the usual symptoms. Like for example, you could have a urinary tract infection. And if you don't have white blood cells, you might not see that in the urine specimen. Or if you have a pneumonia, you might not have a cough with sputum. So we can see in our patients the lack of white blood cell response and like dulled erythema at sites of wounds or central lines or attribute nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea to their chemotherapy. So I think we have to be pretty vigilant. So the big signs are fevers, chills, cough, shortness of breath, runny nose, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, burning or pain with urination, or any sign of skin or central line infection. You're right. It can be so subtle with our patients and it's so important to have the family members understand in case they aren't, you know, in the hospital as an inpatient or coming in every day into the outpatient setting so that they know what to look for. So now that we've talked about that, if a patient does present with these signs, what would the treatment be for febrile neutropenia? Well, if a patient presents with febrile neutropenia, the first thing we should be doing is screening for sepsis. We want to check vital signs, identify any normal vital signs, changes in physical exam or mental status, and start with blood cultures and a lactic acid. And then based on our assessment, if we are able to identify a obvious sign of infection, then we would use empiric treatment. And if a patient has a solid tumor and doesn't have mucositis or diarrhea or any organ dysfunction, and they're really stable, and the only symptom is low-grade fever and they happen to be neutropenic, they may be a candidate for outpatient therapy for febrile neutropenia. And that is absolutely reasonable. It's something we do very common in patients who are stable and simply have a low neutrophil count and a fever. Typically, quinolones are used as impaired therapy. Now, if patients are higher risk or they have any organ dysfunction or other symptoms like, you know, they're unwell, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, any symptoms like that, they should be admitted to the hospital and we would initiate IV antibiotics. Okay. You mentioned a couple of tests that should be done before we initiate empiric antibiotic therapy. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what kind of testing a patient with a suspected febrile neutropenia or infection would have? Yeah, I think the standard workup would be blood cultures, a chest x-ray, and a UA with micro. And if there was anything on the UA, do a reflex culture, urine culture. And then other tests could be done based on symptoms. So for example, if a patient also had diarrhea, I would order C. diff testing. And then we have stool panels that are PCR-based tests that look for a number of different bacterial or viral stool infections. So that could be sent if a patient had an oral ulcer or hepatic type lesion, you could culture that for herpes virus and start empiric therapy for herpes reactivation. If they had a rash that looked like shingles, you know, you could culture that and treat that. So any part of the body where there's symptoms, I would assess that either with some sort of culture or imaging. So with the blood cultures, you know, there's always a lot of talk about what is the best way to obtain blood cultures. Do you have any suggestions on this one? Well, it's controversial. (laughs) What I can tell you is the most important thing about blood cultures is getting adequate volume. So we know that patients can have an infection and we never are able to identify what the infection is. So it doesn't show up in any cultures. We treat them with antibiotics and they get better, but we're never actually able to identify it. So we want to do everything that we can to get the best blood culture and to have the highest chance of actually being able to identify the organism. 
So volume is really important. Each set of blood cultures has an aerobic bottle and an anaerobic bottle, and each bottle should have 10 milliliters. And an appropriate number of blood cultures is two sets. So two sets is four bottles, and four bottles should be 40 milliliters. And that is ideal because the more volume, the more sensitivity in the test. And then where you draw the cultures from is pretty controversial. For a while, we were doing one peripheral and one central and sending, if a patient had a central line, and sending the central and the peripheral blood culture down to the lab at the same time. And the idea was to watch how quickly they turned positive. And if the central line specimen turned positive quicker than the peripheral blood, that was suggestive of it being a central line infection. Those are called time to differential cultures. And I don't find them particularly helpful because what is more important to me is what organism is positive in the bloodstream. And that determines whether or not we can try to salvage the central line. And what I mean by that is if you have, let's say, a pseudomonas infection in the bloodstream, whether it came from the bloodstream or whether it came from the central line does not influence my decision on taking out the central line. The central line has to come out anyway. So we're not going to save it by knowing that it came from the central line because a bloodstream infection can colonize the central line and it's going to have to be taken out anyway. Those aren't used at every institution. And I think that the optimal way to do blood cultures is to do one peripheral and one from the central line or two peripheral using two different peripheral sites. But again, I think you should really think about the patient. Some patients don't have very good access. Some patients have been through a lot and maybe there's a situation where you just want to make it easy for them and draw both of the cultures from the central line. So there are certain circumstances where you might not do it, but I think the most important thing to keep in mind is volume. Thank you. It's really good to know that, you know, unfortunately there are controversies in how some of these things are done as well as just what you said, taking the patient, how they're doing into consideration and really thinking about that, but also wanting to make sure that you're doing the best thing for them to determine if there is an infection going on. So we've talked a lot about febrile neutropenia and as a non-emergency, but we also know that febrile neutropenia can quickly progress to sepsis. So can you talk about what some of the key signs of that transition would be going from febrile neutropenia and progressing to sepsis for us? So the big distinction is organ dysfunction. The most helpful thing is to think about whether or not there's adequate perfusion to all of the organs. So what that means is if you have adequate perfusion to the kidneys, then you're making a lot of urine. If you're not making a lot of urine, there's concern that there's inadequate perfusion to the kidneys. If you have good perfusion to the brain, then your mental status is okay. If you don't have good perfusion, you might have altered mental status. So I think about the organ systems and their function and whether or not there are signs that there is dysfunction. So I think the major things would be altermentation, tachypnea, tachycardia, so the heart beating really fast, not making urine or having burning or pain on urination, nausea or vomiting, and diarrhea. Well, Laura, as you talked about maintaining that adequate perfusion, what is the management of that to help that turn around? so that patients do have adequate perfusion? All patients are screened for sepsis. And one of the big things you can do is check a lactate. And if the lactate is less than two, that's reassuring. If it's greater than two, there's concern that there is inadequate perfusion. And so that would prompt starting your septic bundle. Another really good tip is using capillary refill. So very simple bedside technique we all can do is just check capillary refill. And if it is more than three seconds, there's concern that there's inadequate peripheral perfusion. I think that's really helpful because I think it's important for nurses to know that they do have a role in this. 
it's important for them to understand, you know, the signs and ways to help in this management. So if, you know, one of these nurses that's listening to us today is now back on the unit or in the outpatient department and suspects that they have a patient who is becoming septic, what are the recommendations and guidelines that they should follow for management of it? Obviously, notifying the medical team immediately and the Recommended sepsis bundle is to drop blood cultures, check a lactate, and starting fluid resuscitation with crystalloid given at 30 uh, milliliters per kilogram and starting antibiotics. Laura, is this something that a lot of hospitals may have a standing protocol for that, you know, if a new nurse wanted to find out if this was something that they had in place at their institution, is that kind of standard to have that or not so much? Oh, yes. This is a really important quality measure for hospitals. So I imagine all hospitals have sepsis guidelines and some hospitals have sepsis codes or a sepsis team that's called, or sepsis alerts in the EMR. This is a really, really critical quality measure. So yes, I think everyone's hospital will have some guidelines around sepsis. Perfect. I think that's something really important for our listeners who are new, you know, whether they're right out of school or just even new to the oncology specialty to know and something that they can look for so that they make themselves aware of what the particular guidelines or protocols are in their institution. So based on what current evidence and also just emerging data from clinical trials, can you share a few clinical pearls about infection and sepsis that might help out our listeners to achieve the best patient outcomes? It's actually the nurse who's most often the person who first identifies sepsis in patients. So I think it's really important to trust your clinical judgment. When you look at a patient, it's really easy to tell when something is wrong, when they're starting to breathe too heavy or they're a little bit off and they're starting to get some altered mental status or suddenly their heart rate is elevated for no reason, even though they're just lying in bed. So nurses are really positioned and are most often the ones who first pick up on these subtle signs. I think that looking at some of the trials that have been done over the last couple of years, I think one of the most interesting things for nursing is knowing how effective it is to just quickly check for capillary refill. I mean, it's such a simple bedside test and it offers so much information. It actually offers just as much information as checking a lactate. So that's another great tool that we have. And then making sure that the medical team is notified early and immediately after noticing subtle changes. And then lastly, I would say to continue to reassess patients. It's not like a one and done assessment, but to continually go back and reassess. Okay, we've identified a patient has sepsis. We've started antibiotics. Are they getting better? If not, what are we missing? What else needs to be done? Do we need some additional imaging? Do we have them on the right antibiotics? And if they're getting better, then great, continue this. And at what point are we able to discontinue the antibiotics? And at what point are they well enough to be discharged? Thank you. And Laura, I just want to thank you for your time with us today. This is such an important topic. And like we mentioned at the beginning, it's definitely going to be something that every oncology nurse is going to experience with a patient that they're caring for. Such an important topic to know, understand, and really be comfortable with when caring for their patients. We're getting to the end of our time. So there are a few questions that I always end our podcast with, and I would like to ask those to you real quick now. The first one is, what are common misconceptions about sepsis? I think the most common misconception is that any serious infection is sepsis. Sepsis is a very unique subset of patients that are having a serious and life-threatening 
response to their infection that's also damaging their own body. That's the biggest misconception. Next question is, what is something that's not often discussed about febrile neutropenia or sepsis that you wish people knew more about? One of the things that we overlook is managing patients' blood sugar. In the current surviving sepsis guidelines, it is recommended that you initiate insulin for a glucose greater than 180. We need to do a better job of managing hyperglycemia in patients who have sepsis. What additional training or education do oncology nurses need to better treat their patients with febrile neutropenia or sepsis? Well, keep listening to ONS podcasts, going to ONS conferences. There's a lot of information out there on neutropenia and sepsis. And last, are there any additional resources either for patients or for clinicians who want to learn more about febrile neutropenia and sepsis that you would recommend? I would highly recommend being familiar with NCCM guidelines on prevention and treatment of cancer-related infections. It is an excellent comprehensive guideline and it's my number one resource. The second is the Surviving Sepsis website, which has all of the updated guidelines and a lot of additional research. And there's information for both patients and providers. And then lastly, there's actually a Sepsis Alliance and they have a website. It's www.sepsisinstitute.org. And that also has a lot of really good information on sepsis for patients and providers It's not specific to oncology, but they do have some oncology-specific education. Thank you, Laura. Again, I just want to thank you for being with us today and for your expertise in this area and helping our listeners to kind of have that extra understanding and knowledge of this specific potential oncomergency that patients may encounter during their treatment. Do you have anything you want to share with us. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone listening to this. Oncology nurses are amazing and they are, as I said, almost always often the first to identify sepsis and early identification saves lives and make sure that our oncology patients can continue their treatment. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.